So we're still talking about progressive politics in the early 20th century. And in this segment, I want to particularly emphasize an election that I, I usually emphasize in um, U.S. History Survey as one of the more important or most important, I should say, elections, the election of 1912. As you may recall, um, Theodore Roosevelt, progressive Republican president, had sort of handpicked uh, William Howard Taft to undertake the presidency. He was his sort of hand-selected nominee, and Taft wins the presidency in 1908. In 1909, Theodore Roosevelt leaves the United States, he goes to Africa, he goes on safari, and he returns in 1910. By the time he does return, the Republican Party is already showing some very definite divisions, and Taft is in the middle of it. In the 1910 midterm elections, these are congressional elections, non-presidential election years, in the 1910 midterm elections, progressive reform candidates won approximately 40 seats in the House of Representatives. Now, that suggests that the American public was attuned to the ideas of progressive reform. But for the Republicans, who are themselves divided over progressive reform, it's, an op it, it, it's, a, it's not necessarily a good thing politically because in that same election, 1910, the Democrats take over the House of Representatives. For the Republican Party then, that's not necessarily a good thing. And the battle over progressive reform further divides the Republican Party, the question of what to do. And one element of that is that Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, will, instead of being the friend of William Howard Taft, become one of Taft's sort of bitter enemies. And that sets the stage for a fascinating election in 1912 and uh, for what happens with the Republican Party. The Republicans in 1912 held their convention in Chicago, Illinois, and there were some 254 delegates in dispute. Roosevelt needed to capture approximately 100 disputed delegate votes in order to clinch the nomination. You could argue that Roosevelt at least had a sense that he was fairly close to returning, if not to the presidency, then to being the, the Republican Party's uh, chosen uh, candidate. Theodore Roosevelt had won all 13 of the Republican presidential primaries, and these were relatively new in the early 20th century. They, they are um, an outgrowth of progressive election reform. Well, Roosevelt had won. There's no reason to think he wouldn't get the nomination. Taft was disliked by at least half the party in a big way. Of course, Roosevelt by the other half, I suppose. But it turned out that the fix was in, sort of, that the votes that seemed to be up for grabs, many of them had already been claimed by the Taft supporters. That they had gotten in early and gotten in fast and hard and secured the vote for Taft. The result is that Taft receives the nomination. Roosevelt and his supporters are incensed. Because Taft is sort of a progressive, but he's also sort of a conservative of the McKinley stripe. Now, there had already been a move, remember, a division sort of in the Republican Party led, at least the progressive side, led by a figure named Robert La Follette from Wisconsin. And there was already a sense that should the nomination go to Taft and arguably the conservative side, that these progressives might well break away and consider a third party run at the presidency. It looked as if uh, Bob La Follette, Robert La Follette, would be, in fact, the nominee. So the progressives do decide to run, and they hold a convention also in Chicago in August of 1912. The progressive Republicans gather around Theodore Roosevelt. He's such an iconic figure. Robert La Follette begs off uh, for illness. 
And that opens the door for Theodore Roosevelt to say that he, ha he is as fit as a bull moose. Now, a bull moose, of course, is a large, masculine, uh, male moose. And it becomes the iconic symbol of the progressive party, often referred to as the bull moose party. The Democrats, meanwhile, will meet in Baltimore in June, Baltimore, Maryland, and they'll hold their convention, and after 46 ballots, they will nominate Woodrow Wilson. Wilson, who has a sort of progressive background, uh, provenance. And along with Wilson, as his vice presidential candidate, they will nominate Champ Clark, um, who was quite conservative, and who was Wilson's chief opposition for the nomination. So what we have in 1912 in both the Democratic and the Republican Party are, are deep divisions between those delegates, those politicians who wish to take the country in the progressive direction and that conservative element that wants to sort of pull back from progressive reform. For Taft, it was pretty unlikely for a number of reasons that he actually had much of a chance of winning this election. It could have happened. You never discount someone, but it just didn't seem like there was much of a chance. And from the very beginning, Taft seemed to have this sense that he was just so disliked it wasn't going to happen. In fact, he is quoted as saying, and let me make sure I get this correct, there are so many people in the country who don't like me. Not exactly the words of a winner, if you, you know, if you understand there what I'm saying. Meanwhile, Roosevelt is out just, you know, out really pounding the campaign trail. He proposes as early as 1910 in Osawatomie, uh, Kansas, he proposes a program that will come to be known as the New Nationalism. And in this program, he suggests that he will continue vigorous efforts by the federal government to achieve social justice. And I think that's in many ways a kind of old standard for Roosevelt, suggesting that maybe he's become a wee bit more radical, a wee bit more progressive since his last administration, but ultimately he sees the idea of social justice for the American people bound up with the idea of national interest that the two are the same, that they're linked. A graduated income tax and inheritance tax become part of his program. He also begins to talk about worker compensation. And perhaps most important and even radically, something that Taft himself had uh, approved of or backed, and that was regulation, government regulation, covering female and child labor. It's a, it's a reform that had been called for, called for, called for for decades. And here in 1912, we're absolutely talking about it. Roosevelt also called for tariff revision and for the further regulation of big business. So that's sort of the progressive situation. Woodrow Wilson, who would become the candidate for the Democratic Party, had that longtime progressive pedigree as well, not unlike Theodore Roosevelt. But Woodrow Wilson is a fascinating figure. Wilson, a Democrat, was born in Stanton, Virginia. He grew up during the Civil War and Reconstruction in the South. And to some extent that had to have affected his opinions and his perspective. But much of his professional career was spent not in the South, but actually in the northern United States and in New Jersey. He had gone to Princeton University to study law, and then he had gone on to Johns Hopkins University um, to seek a doctorate in political science. And in 1902, had become uh, the president of Princeton University. There, he fought for academic reform, and he 
demonstrated a trait that would sort of identify his presidency, identify his political career. First of all, maybe coming from his political science background, there was this tendency to think of American party politics in almost a sort of British parliamentary sense where discipline, party discipline, holding together the ranks uh, for, the purpose, for achieving the purposes of the party becomes all important. And the fact is that Wilson demonstrated, even as university president, that he could be a taskmaster that he could have definite ideas, that he was the leader, so a bit authoritarian perhaps, but also that he had about himself a sense of moral righteousness, that the, uh, it was enough that Wilson believed it was important to make it important, to make it right. Listen to Wilson. You don't, you'll pay the price, but that he's right. It's a, it's a sort of confidence, even overconfidence sometimes, that will really haunt, I think, his political career. He goes on in 1910 to become the governor of New Jersey. And there, as governor, uh, he establishes a pretty successful record of progressive legislation. But in the process, and because of a deep unwillingness to give up on his sense of self and a deep unwillingness to compromise, to move beyond simple discipline, to move away from his position, and to compromise with other members of his party or the opposition, um, Wilson finds himself alienated, not only from much of his party, but from the electorate of New Jersey. And probably, had he not left the governorship to run for the presidency in 1912, had he sought re-election, in other words, for the governorship of New Jersey, most likely Wilson would not have won. And it's kind of like the Roosevelt story in New York, where Roosevelt, because of his, his just personality, because of his desperate press to be successful with progressive legislation, Roosevelt sort of moves to the national political realm to get him out of New York. And similarly here, Wilson has managed to move to the national realm of politics in part because of how sour things had become in New Jersey. Wilson puts forward for his 1912 run for the presidency a sort of alternative progressive platform and he calls it the new freedom. It's not so different from the new nationalism. In fact, I often say in, in you know, regular classes that I'm teaching that these two things are these programs are fairly similar after all. Wilson will talk about social justice, he'll talk about income tax, he'll talk about uh, female and child labor regulation, all of that. I guess the major point of differentiation for the new freedom is Wilson's sort of ideas about big business and trust busting. On the one hand, I think Wilson, as a Democrat, has more of a fear of the federal government than Roosevelt does. More of a fear of a president using that executive power to uh, use the federal government to political or ideological ends. Roosevelt, you recall, had started this process that Taft had continued of going after the trusts and busting them for unreasonable restraint of trade under the Sherman Antitrust Act. Really, though, Wilson tends to believe, tends to see trusts as inherently ineffective. It's not that he likes the trust. In fact, it's, it's just the opposite. He dislikes the trust. But rather than use government to try and bust them up after the fact, Wilson leans toward policies that will stop this growth of trusts and combinations, which he in inherently sees as unreasonable restraints to trade and the free market. Wilson wants to stop them in their infancy before they really expand and become powerful, um, powerful factors in the national economy. So again, he's more interested, he's less interested in using government, but he's just as interested in dealing with the trusts. It's just that Wilson wants to see them destroyed before they grow.
And he's willing to use government, but in very limited ways to, to make this happen. Well, the election itself uh, is quite fascinating. It's a three-way, at least a three-way, four if you consider Eugene Debs. Roosevelt takes 27% of the vote, of the popular vote, and wins six states. So an independent party, a third party in American political speak, has actually beat out the Republican Party. William Howard Taft's 23% of the popular vote and two states in the Electoral College. Debs and the Socialists manage about 6% of the popular vote. But it's Woodrow Wilson who, while he doesn't win that clear majority, taking him over 50%, Wilson, with his 42% of the popular vote, will win 435 of 531 electoral votes. Clear win in the Electoral College and in American politics, that's what matters. The result flows from the fact that the Republicans had split. In no small part, the Republicans had split. And that brings a Democrat to the White House for the first time since Grover Cleveland, going back to the 1880s for his first term. Now, you think about that for just a moment, and it seems like, wow, you know, it, it goes all the way back to Reconstruction. It goes back, because remember, Wilson is born in the South. But, of course, he, he professionally is from New Jersey and, and from higher education, from academia. But the real importance here, I think, in the election of 1912 is not the split of the Republican Party, as fascinating as that is, or the emergence of a third-party competitor. Of course, a lot of it had to do with Roosevelt's personality. It's not even so much the emergence of the Democrats, though that is important because, remember, they controlled the House and now they controlled the presidency, 1912. What's really fascinating to me is that if you think about it another way, 70% of the United States electorate supported clear progressive change. They supported either Roosevelt or Wilson. And if you want to consider, as I have suggested, Taft as sort of a forgotten progressive, it just goes to show the degree to which progressive ideas had emerged as the dominant force in American politics by 1912 and this election. So we've spent quite a few lectures on the progressives and progressive politics and progressive ideas and the ways in which progressive ideas emerged from the threats and the radicalism and the needs that the middle class saw for reform, well, by 1912, here it is. What's going to happen in the next year, 1913, will be absolutely amazing in terms of progressive reform. And we'll get to that in the next segment.